you can either take the red pill, and you'll wake up, everything was a dream, or you can take the black pill, you can get torched. Well, I suppose getting torched won't hurt that much. I don't feel anything. Wait for it. Oh, wait. I just got a new client. Get torched! Get, get, get torched! Uh, get torched! I'm Wayne Carey, and this is The Truth Hurts. Well, we've been saying for a while that we're going to have this, uh, well, I won't say uh, young anymore, a uh, lovely young lady um, come in and join us on The Truth Hurts, um, Danielle Laidley. It's been, uh, well, we've seen one another a few times yes, we have. over the last couple of years. Thanks for um, joining me for a chat. Who would have thought? Um, Many years ago we'd be sitting who here. Who would have thought we'd be sitting here? Yep. Um, you know, having, you know, I guess, travelled the road that we've both travelled and now having this conversation in our current states and that road that we've uh, walked, both very different, but yeah. uh, both had had its ups and downs. Um, yeah, it's, um, when you think about it, you know, going back all those years, um, we never had conversations like we will today. Um, for lot for lots of different reasons, mm. you know, our age, the environment that we're in, you know, all those sort of things. Um, but if you had, had told me um, 1993 when I walked into the footy club that we'd be sitting here 30 years later, 30 years. Wow. Um, you know, and said so we were having this conversation, no one would have, in our wildest dreams, I don't think, certainly both of us wouldn't have, have thought that. How... Tell me, because I, I'm not going to... By the way, congratulations on the documentary, which is on Stan. We've spoken about it a couple of times on here. I've, I've watched the whole thing a couple of times and watched a couple of your other interviews. On The Truth Hurts, we're not going to delve into a lot of what you spoke about in your documentary because, you know, some of that is well well known. Certainly is now because I assume it's um, killing it on the documentary. I hope so. But I want to... Yeah, but I want to talk... I want to talk a little bit more about... Because... I love the fact and, and some of the things that I have heard you say, obviously, clearly, you wore a mask for a long time and, and, and you know, had to hide who you really were for a long time. And one of the first uh, shows that I did on this um, podcast, I, I spoke about and people were surprised that I, I said I was a really shy, emotional kid, believe it or not, when people say, oh, yeah, of course you were, Doug. You're as confident, <laughs> as cocky as anyone I've ever met. And... and and, and that's just not true. Um, my, my childhood was the reason why I had and, – and that was always – that's always uh, sitting there. And then, you know, then you go out and you put this mask on and this bravado and this shield and this armour and you go out and play footy and everyone goes, oh, you know, that, and that's what they automatically think. Now, you better than anyone knows exactly what that is like. How, how difficult was that um, – throughout like you said we, we've known one another since yeah. 93 so from from 93 and, I, and obviously you, you, you're doing the same thing through your childhood and 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 then when you're at west coast but the time we've known one another mm. um really interesting when you when you talk about the mask and you talk about your childhood um you know mine was pretty similar um you know and um you i i was a real intense quiet kid um Struggle to really make relationships with with people, you know, having pa getting passed around from you know mum and dad, and then my nana and pop for all my you know early years and then teenage years. Um, you, you do put up um, some pretty strong boundaries, mm. um, and and you won't let people in. Um, now whether that's you know because you don't want to s show a sign of of weakness or whatever that might be. Um, and, you know, through those years, dealing with what I now know is gender dysphoria mm. um, and not um, and, and not knowing what it was then. Um, and that, you know, I got pretty sick through my early teenage years, uh, glandular fever, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, where I actually stopped playing footy. Mm. Um, you know, and then the mask really came on 
for me um, when I went to West Perth Footy Club when I was 16. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I still wouldn't let anyone close, but all of a sudden there was this, you know, bravado of being, you know, an uncompromising, competitive person. Um, and I hid behind that mm. um, because... You know, I'm just trying to hide for, for want of a better word. You're pretty good away. at it. Not yeah. Not 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 push away but but hide mm. um the um the gender dysphoria. Um and then you know, as I then started to make my way in the AFL, um and you know, got to got to North, um my my reputation preceded me um in a few different ways, really. Mm. <laughs> Um, but there was all, all always that mask, um, and the mask of you know if you asked, you know up until the last few years, if you asked anyone in the AFL um, about me, um, they would they would say um, unsociable, aloof, introverted, um, words along those lines, or in other ways. And this was particularly when um, I, I was coaching. Um, Mind you, Swatter did say, Wayne Swatter, who we played mm. with, did say I was an angry person on the field, which was probably the case. Yeah. Um, but also as a coach, being angry and, and, and quite at times volcanic. Um, and they were the two personality traits or the masters we're talking about that, um, um, you know, I, I, I was seen as. And I suppose... I hated myself for that because, and it would really annoy me, but it was the only way I was just trying to survive and, and, and exist and sort of in a way protect myself. Um, and a, as much as I found it difficult, football was still my safe place um, yeah. Yeah. where, you know, we, we had a great team. You know, back through that that period of time, we were very lucky. Um, you know, and it was a, it was a tight group. We won a lot of games, um, and it was it was fun. Um, it probably wasn't fun that first game that we played together. Um, I always remember um, we were supposed to play the Adelaide Crows uh, at Waverley, but there was something wrong with the oval or the turf or something. And anyway, we uh, had to go to Footy Park to play. And uh, every, all the boys are going, wow, oh, we have to travel with it. And I'm thinking, hang on, I've spent the last yeah. six years <laughs> travelling, you know. It's it, an hour it's, flight. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I remember there was myself and, and yourself and um, I think it might have been um, Brad Scholl. We went and had a kick on the night before we took off and anyway, we got over there and I think the plane was late or something. We got beat by 25 goals. Um, and Shimmer ended up getting the sack and then, Maddie Larkin gave up the um, the captaincy, and then Qantas stopped being a major sponsor. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've dragged my whole family <laughs> up to here, and, and, we're we're, and we are cast, <laughs> you know. Um, but the, it, those was those were really interesting times coming coming across, and still having to, you know, going back to the mask. It was it was my way of keeping myself safe or, or normal. Um, I, I suppose, um, and, but then I remember we played in Sydney in 93, um, and Peter McKenna dubbed me the junkyard dog, which I absolutely and still despise, yeah. um, because how I was betraying myself was even further away from the truth, um, and who I really was. And that was the... It was sort of like a vicious cycle, a vicious circle, if you like, you know, trying to be this person that um, it was difficult to manage um, with what was going on underneath the surface as to what I was dealing with on a, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Did, you, did you have an inkling that when you were at West Coast, and clearly, like you said, you build these walls, you build the mask, did you have an inkling that any of the players that you played with at West Coast – you know, that they saw through a part of that mask uh, no, when you were at West Coast? No, I don't think so. No? Um, you know, 
my time at West Coast was, for me, was really disappointing. Um, you know, play in their first squad and um, playing in their first game, in their first final. Um, I had a hell of a lot of injuries as well and mm. missed, you know, like two years with my knee. Um, and so, you know, I don't think um, they saw through it, but now I've reconnected with quite a few of them. Mm. Um, by me telling my story to them, um, and I, you know, I'll always Brings go back, back little things. And they go, oh yeah, and what it does is it's connected the dots for them. Oh, that's why you were, that's why you were like that. Mm-hmm. And it probably has for a lot of the North boys and people I work with and yeah. like, people I coached and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's been a real interesting um, um, journey. But uh, I would say um, the people at West Coast would have had a similar view of from the time I walked into the door at North. Yeah. Um, but there was just some gaps there. Mark Brayshaw, he, he was always, you know, I always felt that there was a gap between. You wouldn't let anyone in, in close and for obvious reasons. There was always, and, and I guess that's the misconception because, you know, we're all oblivious and we're becoming more, I guess, understanding and, and, and knowing all of these different, um, I don't know how you even even mm. word it, but... Um, you know, we're, we're understanding more about the world and, and, and people's different views and how they want to live their life. I guess when you came to North, you know, there, were, there was always a little – there were always little whispers and stuff, you know, you know Danielle's sexuality and, mm. you know, is, 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 yep. is he at the time – is he gay? Or, mm. you know, and there were always these little rumours and innuendo and stuff. Yep. And, and, you know, coming as captain of the club, that came across my desk a little bit and even mm. my sister Karen who – absolutely loves you um you know she said to me a couple of times because she had friends and i don't mm. you know and there was always these little questions and i remember saying to karen i said kaz i said i don't care what mm. <laughs> i said i don't care what um anyone does in their private life me of all people yeah. i said you know that what's their, their private life is their private life so i will be um you know all that i care about is this team ticks on the ground and we all get along and so it never really was one of those things that I felt was, you know, something that you go and talk about. And I know there were probably a few other players that would have heard similar things. Did you ever feel? Did you ever feel that? <laughs> um, I felt it every day that I walked into the footy club. Yeah. Um, and and the reasons why that that happened, um, I think it's in the book, and I I think I might have mentioned in the, in the doco. Um, we West Coast played a preseason game out at Waverley on a Wednesday night, as we did back in those days. And as we did in those days, uh, we went out afterwards. It was a midweek game um, and we went to Chase's um, nightclub, pretty synonymous in Melbourne. Um, and there was a group of us. Now, I don't think any one of those eight or nine players that went along would have gone to that place themselves mm. because of the scrutiny that could have come with that. Um, so I ended up meeting um, a couple of trans girls. There was a group of them. Mm. Um, and we ended up, all of us had this great night together. It was um, funny. Um, and for me, it was an opportunity to talk and ask questions without trying to give anything away. Um, so I, I became friends with a couple of them um, still to this day. Um, and then it wasn't um, – so I think this was about like 89 um, – and then the, the next time we caught up was um, after the 92 grand final. So I'm an emergency for the, for the mm. game. Um, we have the, um, uh, you know, the post-match celebrations. And I, because I missed out, you know, I wanted to sort of get out of there as quick as I could. Um, so I was talking to the girls and they said, come, come out with us. I said, yeah, okay. Um, and they've just given me the address whatever number it was, Commercial Road. Um, and I thought, okay, yeah, cool. So, I, like, I've rolled up, what would it be, 12.30, um, and I've gone, as I've gone, got to the to the front door, um, the security guard goes, you, do you really want to come in here? And I've gone, yeah, yeah, I'm meeting a couple of girls, blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, okay. And then, um, so I walk in there, and, like, I don't even know what this mm. place is at the time. Um, anyway... Um, all of a sudden I had like one or two guys coming up and saying, 
oh, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm here to meet a few girls. And they said, oh, that's what, you, you, that's what everyone says. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, I've just twigged. Um, and it was actually Three Faces, which is a huge gay nightclub at yeah. that point in time. Now, there was um, a couple of, um, I think, sons of uh, staff who were at, working at North Melbourne at the time. And they've spotted me. So this is se- into September 92. Yep. Um, and then I, after through the trade period, get traded to North Melbourne. Um, and um, I remember going to um, a barbecue pre-season. Um, and one of the girls happened to say something to my then wife. We think that your husband is gay. Mm. Um and um yeah, she she challenged me on that and I said, please. Um couldn't be further from the truth. Um and so that's how it sort of started, you know, through those years there started to be like whispers. And yeah. that, that that's probably why even through my time at North Melbourne and, and, and any other uh clubs that when there was ever a conversation about oh, who possibly is a gay player, it would give me really high anxiety and I would get out of that conversation um, as quickly as I could. Um, but then I would have a laugh and think to myself, well, wait till you find out about You're not. me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I always knew because of those couple of things um, that um, – and those girls – were very protective of me um, and are still very protective um, of me. But that, that I su- suppose, Chinese whispers, um, whenever I walked into the club as a player and a coach, it was, it, it was just sitting on my shoulder and that was quite a, a heavy burden. Um, but, you know, as you've said, no one ever um, said anything to me about it. Mm. Um, um, I actually remember Greg Miller um, one day because I ended up working at the club in my in my first year, um, um, and there was a pub just up the road. Um, it's a gay and lesbian club, I think. Uh, the Oasis. Oh yeah, Hotel. yeah, I've been to the Oasis. Yeah, yeah, plenty of times. We yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway. Um, and no, I'm not. Gay. No, no, no. no I'm, I'm not. I'm just. <laughs> no, but. Um, it was, um, it, uh, I had to go and pick up something there and he said to me, just off the cuff, oh, you should know where that is. Ah, right. And like just that that little mm. line was like, oh, my anxiety would just go through the roof, you know, and you know, by me searching out and befriending um, some trans girls and using them as my counsel turned into yeah. this other, you know, thing, which has always been very, very difficult. Um, but now we can sit here and talk about it um, and connect the dots with people. And hopefully if there's any um, player, um, you know, it's obviously quite prevalent with the girls and they're open and honest about it. Mm. Um, and it's a safe space for them uh, within the AFLW. Um you know, and if there's anyone, um, you know, in the men's competition that is dealing, whether it's with gender identity or sexual orientation, that um, in their own time, um, when they feel comfortable, um, you know, I think we'll, everyone will, you know, wrap their arms around them within, let's say, the wider football community. Um, and that, uh, that's why I, I was a bit annoyed at the Four Corners thing a couple of weeks ago when they were talking about, you know, how homophobic the AFL is. It's not, um, it's not an AFL issue. It's a, it's a societal issue. It's, it's wider than that. It's mm. when we step outside of um, you know, our safe space, which is our football clubs, it's um, the scrutiny and the burden um, in society. And that's what I wanted to delve into a lot because that that bird and the mental health side of it. So, I mean, quite astonishing really given that you've got to go to work every day and you're a professional athlete and you've got to go to work every day with that bird. And what, was it a daily thing that you 
had to overcome? So is it is it every training session that you roll up to it? Is it every day when you're at home with your family? Is it, it um, does it sit, sit there all the time, or is it stronger at different times? You know what? Um, I tell you, when it was at its gave me its most anxiety was when I was coaching, mm. um, and you know I would talk about being honest to yourself, honest to each other, to the yeah, to yeah. this playing, well, that's, that's playing a, that's group. That's a coach's mantra. Of course. Yeah. Um, and here I am standing at the front of the group knowing yeah. that I wasn't being honest. Mm. Um, and, I, and I've gone through, I've had to really peel back the layers just on that little part um, because it would really get hold of me. Um and, you know, it was something that I was really disappointed in myself. But as my, as we peel back the layers with my psych, she said, no, you weren't being um, dishonest. You were actually protecting yourself because it wasn't the right time. Um, and, you know, you, you still had a job to do. You didn't really know what was still going on at this point in time. Um, even though there was internet, certainly when I was coaching and, um, you, you you could research and read and all, all that sort of stuff. So I was far greater educated um, when I was – and knowing what I fully know now when I was coaching but far less as a player. It was – when I was a player, just those instances that we're talking about, um, it was more – it would take me back to um, – that, that series of events which led to the rumour in innuendo. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, the coaching stuff I found particularly, particularly hard. I know we've um, spoken about this before and, and uh, when we, I think when we first uh, met, um, when we first, when I first met Danielle and we spoke about it and I remember saying uh, when we played against North Melbourne for the first time, I've obviously left, left the Crows, um, everyone knows why I left the Crows, and I'm playing against North for the first time, and you gave the team instructions, you know, don't just, just you know what, mm. no matter what happens, don't shake Duck's hand. That, that sat with me for a fair while, and we discussed it when we met. And I always, I always had this, you know, anxiety, and I've, obviously the, the, the next time I thought I'd run into you, I thought I'd be talking to obviously Dean, yep. right? Mm. And, and, but I said, I thought – I. And going to meet you that day, talk about anxiety, because yep. I know what you've been carrying. Mm. Here I am going, mate, well, all that happened was, you know, the instructions not to shake my hand. So I'm going there going, should I bring it up? Mm. Is it something that, you know, you know, you know, you, you, you're going to, you, you want to answer? So I went there with all this trepidation and, 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 yep. and like I said, you know, different anxiety. You had an anxiety. I had an anxiety that first time we met. Mm. And and I must say, I walked away, and and you know you 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 know apologised and, mm. and told me what had occurred the week before, mm. um, and I walked away. And let's be honest, if I was to hold a grudge against anyone <laughs> for saying something poorly or doing something wrong, I wouldn't talk to too many people. So I walked away, and I just it, it was like this weight had been lifted off my shoulders that I had, that I had talked to you about that. Yep. And the forgiveness was immediate. Um, you sent me a nice message after, and I just thought, I'm just glad I, I, I and 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 I didn't really know what the circumstances no. was. So um, yeah, so I held a lot of I you know, that that first meeting. There was so much uh, going on in my head when mm. we when we first caught up on that occasion. Um, and, and it's been similar with you know a lot of people that I met on on my behalf, and I know on let's say in our instance, your behalf, um, you know, and I've sort of taken it upon myself to try and reach out, be honest, put everything on the table um, to make everyone feel comfortable um, through that period of time, um, you know, and w when you said that to me, it was like, it was like a dagger in the heart for me, um, but I could also understand that, you know, you walking around with that and, Regardless of what happened, you know, what you did for the footy club as a captain, as a player, um, and then um, to think that 
you know, that's would be my objective to say, you know what, like just wipe him off the table. Um, you know, as I said, being a, being a young coach and we played Dennis or Carlton week the, uh, the week before um, and I went down the wrong track and I've said this to you, wound the boys up emotionally and I got mostly involved and we, we lost the game, um, I think by five points and then it was like consecutive Friday night games. And then obviously it's... Um, we're playing Adelaide Crows the, f- the the following week, so it was like, okay, um, let's just regard the uh, opposition, and obviously you're playing in the opposition. We've got to focus in on what we're doing. Um, cause as a young coach in my first year, I think it was yeah, it was my sixth or seventh game, um, and in those first those first games were tough. So, you know, when when you did tell me that, like I, you know. My draw nearly dropped on the ground, um, but I'm glad we actually could speak about that um, and have those conversations. Um, um, you know, it's it certainly helped me, um, and you know, I hope it's helped you. No, it certainly did, and and once again, like I said, as soon as I got, you know, the apology, I, I the forgiveness was was instant. So let's move let's move to everyday life now. Now. Clearly, your life has changed. You know, um, just a little, <laughs> just a little. So you're not, you're no longer, you no longer can walk down the street and not be recognised. I, I assume um, that's not. I, I don't confess to be Mel Gibson, but I've, I've had that for a little while. Mm. Um, <laughs> you've always got someone coming up and saying g'day. So someone's always watching. Do you do you walk down the street now with your head high and feel good about yourself? Or, do, or is there still that insecure, you know, what are people, because once again, without sounding like a, a dick, you know, I went through a period through my footy career and even at times after going to a restaurant, you know, people know who you are. So, and they're judging you yeah. because of mistakes you've made yeah. and what, whatever you've done or, so, you know, they're talking about you. And I went through a stage where I just, that just overwhelmed me mm. and I, and I couldn't enjoy the person's company that I was with because yep. I was worried about what everyone else was saying. Mm. And whether it be good or bad, I never said it to your face. Yep. But they're, they're just murmurs, and you know what's going on. I've over, I overcome that through a lot of work, mm-hmm. through you know speaking to professionals and everything else, and then the penny dropped, and now I can be in a moment. Yep. And it's oh, it's so re- for refreshing to be able to go to a restaurant or go to the races or go and speak to people, sit here and do this podcast, and have that just have that even that you know we all still have our. Uh, our issues and thoughts and it's still an ongoing thing but that burden for me has been lifted can you can you do that on a daily basis now or does it fluctuate um on the whole now um donna and i um get to live in the present yeah which has life's been much easier now there's still ongoing issues that you know i'm working through but everyone here in their life has different yeah. issues um, and it is far more relaxing, less anxiety, um, less uh, depression, um, which we saw on the, uh, on the doco. So it, it, it's really gone, um, the whole spectrum of initially when it came out, um, it went to rehab and then get out and walking down the street, um, you know, I I still had to be myself, the, or the new person yeah. that people were, were seeing, and that's taken um, people uh, some time to get their head around because I had some sort of a public figure. Before. Yeah, of course. Um, and but there was I was also ashamed and embarrassment of what went on at that time. Um, you know the blow up with the uh, with the police, and you know the drugs, uh, um, and then in getting charged and going to court, and you know all those things. So there was some real embarrassment where I still had to be myself, um, but I was I was head down a little. I yep. At times, a lot. Yeah, a lot. Um, and then um, I, I've just gained confidence through. Being accepted, um, and because let's face it, when when the when it all first came out, that the narrative was 
pretty pretty unkind. Um, and um, we had no control over that um, as a family. Um, it was a lot of innuendo, um, stuff that we've touched on before. There was, you know, some part of that still bubbling through. Um, and that, you, you know, I'm, I'm a, a cross-dressing drug addict, whatever. Um, and I then, I suppose, as we've slowly been able to change the narrative with all the support that we've had, um, you know, now I'm, I, I can feel myself um, being much more confident in myself. Yep. Um, you know, because you carry that burden, that shame and embarrassment and fear of what people would say or think and that sort of stuff. Um, but I've really learned um, to live in the present, not listen to the keyboard warriors, not listen to um, people who just want to be nasty and, and, and bring you down and that. You know, I, I, I don't have time for that. Um, and we get stopped, you know, in the street, even on, on the weekend. Um, but we've been in Melbourne now for a few weeks, um, you know, obviously over the finals and stuff. And even f- since the uh, doco came out. A couple of weeks ago. Two weeks. Yep. Um, to now, to just last week, um, and, you know, going to a grand final lunch on Friday, going to the game on Saturday going to the September club, mm. going to the city to catch up with Kane, it's like, oh, and it was like. So you do feel, you feel the, we, the eyes, the eyes. Yeah, the yeah. eyes, the eyes. Yeah. Like on the weekend, it was like quite unbelievable. Um, still, what when people talk to you, photo or anything, very positive. Oh, great yeah. documentary. We've watched a documentary. I've read your book doing such great things um, and that's all very positive but the the burden of the eyes yeah. just just in itself is like uh, until you actually um, you know live it no you can't. It. no one can explain no one it's, can explain unless you've lived yeah. it yeah do you, do you try to judge when that happens are you and and you're in that and you do feel overwhelmed by it are you trying to judge you know what what are their eyes thinking? What what's he thinking? Is, is that is that comment condescending? Are they being truthful? Uh, is that just and it's just like a thousand thoughts going through your head? One hundred percent, absolutely spot on, Doug. <laughs> it, it, it is so true. Like mm. even um, going into the ground, like people are tapping you on the shoulder. Oh, the doco's great, isn't it? but then you see at the corner of your eye, uh, two males yeah. probably in their mid thirties, like. Sniggering, yeah. Sniggering, like turning around, laughing, looking at you, yeah, and, and just like to think, yeah, like yeah. give it away, yeah. like please, you know. Um, but that's and that's that's as part of society. So for me, it doesn't matter whether you're transgender, gay, bi, lesbian, from a different culture. You're either a good person or you're a bad person. Um, and I just don't know why people. Um, are so nasty, but it also might be Donna and I thinking, like you're saying, what are they saying? Are they being condescending? Are mm. they putting us down? Um, you know, at the footy this year, probably on three or four of occasions where um, people have sort of come up beside us and try to take a like a sneaky, um, self, you know, yeah, yeah, s- selfie. And um, I remember one day, I think I think it might have been round one earlier this year, and I'm standing next to Donna, and I just feel her launch like across three lanes <laughs> to these blokes. Hey, if you want a photo, just ask. just ask. Yeah. No issue. It doesn't cost us anything. Mm. Be respectful um, and, you know, enjoy the game and get on with it. Um, so, like, they were sort of then quite sheepish um, with that. And as we got to the gate, I just leaned over to the guy and sort of grabbed him the back of the elbow, said, hey, just be respectful. That's all it is. Just yep. be respectful. You want a photo? No issue. Yeah. But I'm 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 not going to walk past that behaviour and not say anything. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not going to. I don't want to try and change the world or anything. But just 
we're all humans. Just be respectful. Or, you know, if you're eating in a restaurant and someone comes up and says, oh, sorry, can I have a photo? When actually, you're not sorry. You can see we're eating no, yeah. and we're talking. Yeah. Find the right moment mm. and, yeah, sure, yep. you know, you've done it 10 million times. Have, have you come to the conclusion, because once again, no, no, no way am I comparing us. I'm, well, but I, I understand those looks. I understand people trying to take photos. I understand all of that. I think one of the big things that, that has helped me is that understanding that that is for me, and I don't know what the fascination with me is, but it's never going to change. So who I'm dating at the time, what I'm doing in my life, private life, all of that. So it's just for whatever reason there's something that needs to be said. So or or when you're out, same same if you come to the realization that that's going to be with you for forever. Uh yeah we have. Um and and I have to say apart from the initial narrative, um story not now words and that. Since we've grabbed hold of the narrative and turned that around, it, it, in a way we've been become the darlings of the media a bit um, and it's a good story and that. I can flip that very quickly. That's my point. <laughs> um, oh, well, they're very good at, they're where, very, where they're very good at going. Yep. <laughs> yes. where, and, and, and we know, we know it's, it's purely about the story. Um, and, you know, oh, I'm sure we'll be on the end of something or someone or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, we, we spoke, we speak um, not often, but enough to say, well, yeah, let's enjoy this for what it is. Um, mm. And because it's going to be, um, it's going to be there forever. Um, I, I tell you what, uh, Donna taught me something. She saw this. Um, it was that. Um, Bert Newton's funeral um, and Paddy got out of the car um, and the first thing she did to w- wave to all the paps and you know blew him kisses and everything um, and um, I think later it, it, there was something in an article where you know um, I know it's all about the story um, but I've been respectful for them hopefully they'll be respectful for me um, and, and, and it was a pretty good sort of baseline to, to work off. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy now that um, this stage of my life that I can talk about anything, you know, um, whether it's hair, makeup, shoes, whatever it might be, to talk on footy. Um, you know, I, I've not been able to do that my whole life. I, I did take... Um I did take special interest in, in one of the comments you made in your documentary. Not you said we didn't want to go back to the documentary, but just you wanted to coach. You thought you might one day want to coach again. I thought that was um, interesting and 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 um, not brave, but interesting that you would put yourself back in that cauldron, given yeah. <laughs> given the pressure that that brings. Yeah, um, and, w- and when I say coaching, I'm not talking about. AFL. AFL. Okay. No, uh, definitely not. Um, you know, I've, I've done my time and, and, and I've enjoyed it. Um, some parts of it, some parts not so much. But um, to be able to give back, um, whether it's AFLW, whether it's State League, whether it's, um, you know, one, one of my best years was in 2019 where I coached at Maribyrnong um, where your nephew used to play. Um, yep. And um, I would have to say, you know, we didn't make the finals or anything that year, but that would be in the top five or six years of my whole foot. It was just, I loved it. Um, so even to be able to give back now, um, because I can, um, would be pretty cool. So the passion from this point on is sending your message. Yeah. Um, obviously, obviously, you know, not hiding away, mm. but putting yourself front and centre. Yeah. So uh, uh, we do – so we've sort of been um, uh, contracted with the doco. So we've been able to do some corporate um, 
diversity inclusion training specific to transgender people uh, in the workforce. Um, so we'll be we'll be ramping that up um, across across the country. Um, there'll be some of that diversity inclusion work and ambassadorial um, work um, hopefully next year with the AFL. Um, I would love to um, get on radio. Um, you know, I've probably done that for five or six years. Uh, well, special well, comments, yeah, yep, and that sort of stuff. Good job. Um, you know, it's yeah, it is a great job. Radio, great job. radio yep. is fun. Good fun. Uh, it really is. Triple um, M would be a great fit for you. <laughs> well, no, it really would. Do you know the boss? <laughs> hey, you and yes, no. that would be a great fit. Yeah, so you know, there's fun. so there's there's stuff like that. Um, you know, and we we have our own um, disability um, uh, business in Perth. Uh, where we house disability clients in our supported independent living houses and give them 24-7 care. Um, so Donald runs most of that. Um, and then we're sort of back and forward um, uh, between Perth and Melbourne every every few weeks. Um, it does get a little bit tiring. We're not spring chickens anymore. But, um, you know, so that, that sort of fills our cup. So anything with footy, because it's in my blood, um, and I still have a passion for it. Um, and anything to do with particularly the rain or the rainbow and particularly the transgender community. Um, you know, it was only um, last week or the week before, mid of the week before, um, we travelled down to country Victoria and we had 80 gender diverse kids um, from around the area. Uh, we spent so, so, so 80? 80. 80. And what sort of area does that? Help? I won't go into the area no, because it's, it's quite oh, okay. Personal. But it's, well, yeah. it's, it's a big area, big area. Um, and they all came in, and we gave them a safe space for the day. We give them an opportunity to have a chat, um, tell a little bit about my story, mm. um, and that was with either parents, school teachers, um, or carers who who brought them in. Um, you know, so things like that. We did it earlier this year um, at the Victorian Pride Centre. We bust 130 gender diverse kids from around the whole state um, uh, with a group that got some funding um, and, um, you know, gave them, um, did some workshops, uh, gave, them, gave them some lunch. They were able to converse with other uh, gender diverse kids because particularly in the country, you know, it's... They become quite isolated. How come there's no one else like me? Um, they give up playing footy or netball because there's no one else like that, um, you know, that's playing the game and I'm the only one, so no, I won't play. Um, and with gender-diverse kids, the first thing that they'll drop out of is sport. Um, and as we know, the backbone of Australian culture, um, particularly in, in regional areas, are football, cricket, netball clubs. Mm. Um because they, uh, people are a part of something, can belong to something. Can, um, yeah, so we love doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, well, mate, I, I didn't want to keep you all day. What I, what, I'm, what I was fascinated about and what we haven't spoken about personally is, and, and, I, and this is what we love talking about on The Truth Hurts and I love talking, I do some stuff with the GBS as well um, in my spare time around men's uh, mental health. And that is, you know, everyone has a, everyone has a story. I'm a big believer. Of, that's what I've learnt after I've retired. Everyone has a story and everyone has a really interesting story. And when you sit back and listen, and I'm fascinated by how people get through it and understand that it's a daily battle for, for some and, it, and it's a constant thing. And especially now that you're, you know, obviously more in the, more in the public eye than you've ever been. Um, it's, uh, th that's, that's what really intrigues me because the reason why it intrigues me because it helps me as well. It's quite, and it's, you know what, I, I'm glad you said that because for me it's very therapeutic to sit down and with you and, um, and, and, and be able to talk about, um, you know, these issues. And we're lucky enough to have platforms like this and other platforms that we've had over our journeys to um, tell our story. But as you say, everyone's got a story and everyone's has an important story and they could easily come and sit where we are today and tell their story and people would get something out of it. And 
So for me, the bottom line with that is our ability to talk and converse and listen um, and because you'll always learn something from someone. And I, I think, you know, platforms like this yeah, are, are an incredible thing. Oh, well, thanks, coming on. thanks for coming on The Truth Hurts. Cheers, uh, good thank to catch you for having up. us. Great. Look forward to having a, a beer with uh, a few of the old teammates uh, sometime in the future. Absolutely. You can either take the red pill, you'll wake up, everything was a dream. Or you can take the black pill, you can get torched. Well, I suppose getting torched won't hurt that much. I don't feel anything. Wait for it. Oh, wait. I just got a new client. Get torched! Get, get, get torched! Get torched!